Namaskar to all. A very warm good evening to everyone present here. I welcome all our viewers to our today's evening session. At the outset, let me welcome all the distinguished panelists who have joined our studio. I welcome our distinguished speaker, Dr. Muhammad Jahir sir, our Director General of Heritage Society, Dr. Anant Astos Devedi sir, Mrinali ji, Dr. Astha Dibhyopama ji, and Dibhya Saini ji. I welcome all of you to our today's evening session. Today, it's our 174th episode of the Distinguished Lecture Series being organized by the Archaeological Exploration and Excavation Department of Heritage Society. This weekly lecture series, popularly known as Birasat Talk, commenced last year. And since then, we have been regularly organizing at weekly level this lecture series. This lecture series has witnessed huge success and has reached to a large number of audience worldwide. The tragic pandemic which we are facing from the last two years has although physically disconnected us, but the online mediums has allowed us to stay connected through different online mediums. And so our today program is live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter page of Heritage Society. I request all our viewers, our followers, you may also post comment, feedback, or your questions and queries in our comment box during the live session. So I want to discuss those queries with our distinguished speaker today. There is also a feedback form in the description of this link of our video. You can fill this feedback form at the end of the session to receive the participation certificate at the end of the session. The theme of our today's international web webinar is Say no to mainstream religions and empires, exploring and contextualizing archaeological evidence in Chitral region. And to speak on this session, uh, on this important theme, we are very privileged and have an opportunity to welcome our distinguished speaker, Dr. Muhammad Jahir, sir, who has joined us already. Without taking much time, I would now request Mrinali ji, coordinator of Heritage Society, Junjunu Kapsu, and faculty of Adults Postgraduate College, Hilani, to kindly present the welcome address and introduce our distinguished speaker. Mrinali ji. Good evening, all. Today we have gathered here for the 174th session of the Virasa Talk series, organized under the ages of Archaeological Exploration and Excavation Department. Heritage Society, Patna. The theme of this session is Say No to Mainstream Religions and Empires, Exploring and Contextualizing Archaeological Evidences in Chitral Region. I extend my warm welcome and gratitude to Dr. Muhammad Zahir, who is an associate professor in the Department of Archaeology, Hazara University, Mansehra, Pakistan, and also Director General of Heritage Society, Dr. Anant Ashutosh Divedi, on behalf of Heritage Society, I welcome all the viewers and listeners. Heritage Society is working diligently towards promoting and protecting the rich and diversified heritage and culture of India through organizing various programs like exploration, excavations, and talk series. The Heritage Society also promotes awareness among the common masses. Today, we have Dr. Muhammad Zahir among us, Apart from being an associate professor, he is also serving as research affiliate at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History, Jena, Germany. His research interest primarily focuses on the archaeology of Khivar, Pakhtunkhwa, Baluchistan, Punjab, and Gilgit, Bal Baltistan provinces of Pakistan. Further, he also widely discussed the African migrations the emergence, development, and decline of Indus Valley civilization, the Buddhist art and archaeology, and theoretical and methodological issues of Pakistan archaeology. He has co-authored several papers and journals with various prominent archaeologists and scientists, and his papers appeared in prestigious journals like Science and Nature, Ecology and Evolution, Nature Communication, and many more. 
He has been involved in excavation and explorations at Harappa, Bias River, South and Taxila Valley, and of course many more. He has delivered lectures in leading universities of USA, UK, and Europe, which included universities of Harvard, Cambridge, Bradford, Max Planck, and many more. He also spoke at various public and academic forums in countries like Japan, South Korea, and China. He is the visiting fellow at International Visiting Leadership Program, USA, the American Institute of Pakistan Studies, arranged his lectures at University of Wisconsin, Medicine, Philadelphia, California, State University, and Harvard as well. He is also the first visiting Pakistani fellow at the in Ancient India and Iran Trust, Cambridge, UK, and the inaugural Aman Fellowship at Harvard University. He has much accolades in his pocket, like he is a MA Gold Medalist from University of Peshawar. His PhD thesis was accepted as submitted at the University of Leicester, UK. He has successfully completed his postdoctoral research at Harvard University as well. He has also been recently nominated as the first Pakistani research fellow at the Department of Archaeology and Ethnography, Novosibik State University, Russia. As he is interested in public and philanthropic work as well, he has also presented and co-scripted the two most successful documentaries for Pakistani television, as the, as the themes of those two television broadcasted were Buddhism in Gandhar and the story of mighty Indus. So, sir, I now I request you to kindly open the session and the platform is all yours. Thank you, Dr. Zaheer. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mirnali ji. Uh, may I now request Dr. Astha Dibhya Pamaji to present introductory remarks. Thank you so much, Dr. Raja. Uh, finally, we are thankful to Dr. Jahir. Finally, we, he is with us. And uh, uh, I must congratulate Heritage Society and uh, Dr. Divedi ji, because Dr. Jahir is the first ever archaeologist from the Pakistan region who is speaking in the Heritage Society platform. So this is this must be the inaugural uh, lecture from the for the scholars of Pakistan region. And uh, before uh, giving introduction of uh, today's talk of Dr. Jahir, uh, first I would like to uh, give a little bit idea about the like a, a, um, a research uh, kind of research or kind of thoughts Dr. Jahir has about the archaeology. Uh, recently, uh, before few days ago, I was listening to his some of the uh, interview on YouTube. He has like artist profile, uh, so there he has like uh, spoke few uh, words which are quite uh, impressive for any archaeologist or any uh, heritage interest. A uh, first one is jin mulko ki ka itihas nahi hota, jin mulko ki tarikhe nahi hoti, unka koi bhavishya nahi hota aur unka koi future nahi hota. And second one is quite impressive. Uh, that is, ki whenever I go to any Southeast Asian countries like China, Japan, or Korea, I I told them like your gods were born in our country. So this is quite interesting, quite interesting, and I think this is quite relevant for the region like uh, Bihar in in India also, because the uh, Lord Buddha and Mahavir they have born in Bihar. So uh, this is uh, uh, so uh, now I will come to the like uh, today's talk, introducing the uh, today's talk. So say uh, no to mainstream religion and umpires and contextualizing the archaeology of the Chitral region. So Chitral region is basically uh, this uh, region is located in northwestern uh, province of the Pakistan, and uh, this uh, Chitral region is surrounded by uh, rivers and uh, mountains and it comes like uh, it is uh, in, the, in, in between of the Pamir and Hindu Kush ranges. Uh, if we see the history of the archaeological research of the Chitral region, uh, there are uh, like in early 20th century, th there are not much work was done by the archaeologists or researchers. But after 1998 or 1999, 
there are uh, several researchers and scholars and several archaeological expeditions started in this particular region and a special mention would be like a work by dr jahid at all they have worked with this region and uh, whatever the uh, the data they have retrieved from the uh, archaeological <coughs> expedition uh, uh, like a uh, antiquities or whatever the data they have like uh, pottery or uh, figurine whatever they have got that is quite unique and in character and also very uh, less amount of the archaeological uh, objects they have recovered so because of that they are uh, like uh, they are uh, there are lo lots of research attempts are going on for the co contextualizing the archaeology of this region because they are not getting any evidence of like any connection with the any mainstream religions like a hinduism buddhism or uh, any mainstream empires who who had like they have they had present in that particular region like Achaemenid Empire or Kushana Empires, uh, their presence was felt in this particular region, but still there are no not any such evidences uh, they have got, so they can find out the direct connection between both of this uh, mainstream empires or mainstream religion. So I think uh, this is the main theme of this talk. Uh, if I am like uh, lacking something, I am sure Dr. Jahi he will guide us. And uh, with this, uh, these remarks, I would like to end this introductory uh, part, introduction part of this uh, uh, particular lecture. But uh, one, uh, I, I, I'm sure Dr. Divedi ji will uh, definitely acknowledge. But uh, I would also like to mention we are extremely grateful, grateful to the authorities of the Hajara University for uh, giving us opportunity to have Dr. Jahir with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Astha ji. Uh, may I now request Dr. Jahir Muhammad sir to kindly begin the session. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you and good evening to everyone. Salam, Adab uh, to all of you. Uh, thank you, uh, Heritage Society. Uh, I'm, I'm very much grateful to Dr. Dividi ji, uh, Azad ji, Dr. Asta Divyopama, Nalini, and Divya ji. I, I, I'm, I'm very much thankful to you for giving me this opportunity. In fact, you know, Dr. Asta chased me for almost a year to, 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 to give this lecture and I promised earlier that I'll be delivering a lecture but uh, due to my field engagement I could not uh, get on to uh, I could not follow my schedule uh, lecture in this society so thank you very much it it's indeed a pleasure to be here and I'm, I'm very much thankful uh, to the society for giving us this opportunity uh, uh, indeed it's uh, very important that we share information within these two countries. Uh, we are um, um, geographically very near to each other, but because of the constru constructed uh, boundaries between the people of the two, uh, the people from both sides, uh, we are unable to communicate, especially in, in uh, sharing knowledge and sharing information. So there is a lot of archaeology, archaeological excavations, explorations happening in India that we, we do not know, although we keep trying uh, to, to keep ourselves informed. And similarly, there is a lot of archaeological thoughts are going on over here in this part of the world. And our colleagues and friends and students of archaeology and history of South Asia are not aware of it. So it was one of my uh, objective is to share what we were doing um, in, in, in a very small valley uh, in northern and northwestern Pakistan and to share the information with you uh, and through your society with the people of um, India, concerned people of India. Now, uh, I must acknowledge the support and help of uh, my professor, Professor Esan Ali, uh, my supervisor, Dr. Ruth Yang, uh, and uh, there are many people, especially I have a friend in Indian Kashmir, uh, Dr. Mumtaz Yattu, who was very instrumental. We, we studied together and we had um, shared a lot of the ideas. Some of the ideas may stem from our discussions with him. So I'm very much thankful. I, I'm also thankful to Dr. Asta for uh, some of the ideas that are now being presented. Uh, I shared uh, with her earlier and uh, you know we have uh, reached a certain conclusion. Now, the, uh, I would like <clears throat> to present, I, I think you can see my screen now. Uh, Azadji, can you? Uh, 
Can you see my screen? Yes, no, we are able to see your screen, sir. Okay, so the uh, my I, I'll be talking about Chitral region mainly, and I'll be uh, exploring and contextualizing the archaeological evidence in the Chitral region. So Chitral is basically we we are talking about if if we are talking about South Asia generally the archaeological uh, knowledge of the South Asia is constructed uh, or most of the knowledge is constructed within the Indus Valley uh, the 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 region of the Indus Valley and the region of the Ganges so so both of these regions most of the archaeological knowledge of the South Asia is constructed and, and there is um, there is not enough knowledge about the borders uh, or the borderlands or the border regions of the South Asia so for particularly about this region we do not have unfortunately the situations in Afghanistan also does not help so it, it it does not uh, we, we do not have a lot of information about these regions generally and uh, there has been some work in indian kashmir but most of the area um, is almost unknown archaeologically and, and this situation remained until you know until almost until the end of the 20th century so there has been some work done in the upper indus valley by the german archaeologists who primarily concerned themselves with the, the study of the rock art, but the archaeology of the region is um, hardly understood. Now, uh, if you know the geography of the Pakistan, Pakistan has got four provinces. Uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa is one of the smallest, or in fact, the smallest province of the of the Pakistani state. Uh, and we will be talking about uh, the, the region of Chatral. So Chatral is on the boundary. Uh, with uh, Afghanistan. So this small area that you can see is the Wahan corridor. Uh, this corridor separates Pakistan from Tajikistan. And it was one of the, the, the British Empire gave it to the, the, the Amir Abdul Rahman of the Afghanistan in 1880s um, uh, uh, to safeguard itself or to not share a border with the Tsars uh, Russia in the 1880s of the first great game of the Central Asia. So, so this area separates uh, our study area from Central Asia. So you, you can see that it is almost the extreme north um, or northwestern uh, area of the subcontinent or South Asia. Now, the region is primarily, uh, these re, uh, the area is a uh, elongated valley and it is defined by uh, mountains uh, on both sides, on the the northern side, the eastern and western side. So most of the mountains on the eastern side, uh, on the western side, sorry, uh, are the Hindu Kush mountains. And on the northern uh, or the west uh, eastern side um, are the mountains of the Hindu Raj mountains. So the Hindu Raj mountains separate it from the Swat uh, and Thir area while the Hindu Kush area separates it from Central Asia and parts of the Afghanistan. So the Afghanistan uh, uh, region, say for example, the Badakhshan, which was very famous for the lapis lazuli, uh, is separated, from, uh, is very near to the study area. And then there is the Kunar area of Afghanistan uh, over here. So so these, are, uh, these areas are joined by, there are numerous uh, passes within this area. In fact, uh, we documented about, um, or at least we 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 numbered about 400 uh, something uh, passes within the Hindu Kush mountains uh, that uh, connect uh, parts of Pakistan with parts of Afghanistan, and this area is uh, known um, to be very accessible. Although the mountains are unex um, looks like inaccessible, but they are very accessible through these passes. And uh, over here we have the uh, Barogal Pass. The Barogal Pass is um, possibly the easiest pass to cross the uh, to cross into Central Asia from from Gilgit and Chatral region, or in within the northern and northwestern South Asia. Now Chatral is is a very beautiful place. It's indeed. Uh, Parts of it area, parts of the region looks like uh, paradise on earth. So, so there are mountains, there are glaciers 
Yeah, there are beautiful valleys and then the pine trees, you know, the valleys, the river valleys. Uh, it is primarily a mountains area. So wherever you go, there are mountains and it is uh, because of these mountains, you know, it is a remote part and it, remoteness and secludedness uh, is uh, defining its archaeology as well. So the, the areas is surrounded by mountains and these mountains, some of these mountains, you know, are inaccessible for six months of the year. Uh, although now we have constructed, um, you know, there are tunnels are tunneled within the mountains which connect this area throughout the year with the rest of the Pakistan. But in the past, and even in the recent part, it's for very difficult to, uh, to keep uh, in communication with this region um, in winter especially. And this region is also known for the Kalasha indigenous tribe. The Kalasha indigenous tribe is uh, perhaps one of the oldest um, living uh, non-Muslim um, community in the Hindu Kush mountains. And they, they trace their origin. They are very beautiful. Most of them, you know, as you know, the British, the initial British have put them as, you know, they are white, you know, they are blue eyed, they are blondes within it and they are very similar to the European population and most of these people believe that they, they, they have come from the armies of the Alexander the Great. Now they are different from the other people uh, of the region and because you know they, they, they have a pagan religion uh, in, uh, in view of the, the local Muslims uh, and they think that they, they are worshipping these gods and they have these um, temples uh, which are inaccessible to the women of course you know so the women can cannot um, access the temples and and, and they bury uh, they don't bury their dead uh, at least uh, until 30 years ago they used to keep the the their dead uh, in open cemeteries and and they would decay um, in the vicinities of their settlement so the death festivity and death, uh, celebrating death is part of their uh, lives, you know, and they, they are very much interested. So so for this reason, Kalash is known. And, and over here, you can see that these are um, cowrie shells. They are part of the hairdress. You will, uh, at the end of the lecture, you know, they, they, they are, there are similar objects coming from archaeological excavation that I'll be showing you. Now the local people over here, they are they are very supportive. Perhaps it is the most peaceful area um, in terms of the crime, in terms of the any uh, unlawful activities within Pakistan. The people are very peaceful, and they are very supportive uh, uh, to the outsider so people. Uh, so if, if there are local people or tourists going there, or even if people from foreign lands are coming over here, foreigners are coming, they are welcome and they, they are very supportive. So the same nature is extended to supporting archaeological research. So wherever uh, archaeologists would go, they would bring out the objects that they have encountered in their, uh, in their fields while constructing their houses um, or when constructing graves uh, for the newly um, deceased Muslims. So they'll find these objects. So this led to the creation of knowledge within this area, which is based upon the cooperation of the local uh, people. And, and this is a type of methodology that is being used or widely used within the Pakistani archaeology and it is called village to village survey. So archaeologists within Pakistan go from one village to another village, mostly near the roads, and they, they come up with um, either they find a site with the help of the locals. So for example, this man took us to his field where he has found, you know, this is um, a grave site. Uh, that I'll be explaining later on, but he showed us, you know, there are graves, and and this is how the archaeology is being done in Pakistan. We, uh, with the support of my supervisor, Dr. Ruth Yang and Professor Esan Ali, we have done some uh, systematic research. So we try to do systematic transit surveys within the Gilgit Baltistan area and within the Chatral area, uh, and, and this has. Uh, tremendously increased the knowledge of theory. Now, this 
village to village survey led to the creation of an archaeological map so for example this map uh, that i created some time ago uh, but this has not been uh, to to my knowledge has not been updated until now and it was based upon the village to village survey so you you will see that most of the village uh, most of the archaeological sites uh, represented by a black dot are near the river, River Chatral, which flows through the middle of the Chatral region. Uh, and most of these, uh, the roads are constructed along the uh, uh, rivers. So these are very near to the roads. And we do not have information about, you know, some of the areas. There, there is not enough information about uh, most most of the Chatral region. We, we have only information. Uh, and this is a lacuna within the, the methodology that is being adopted. So within these archaeological sites that, that um, uh, we documented, that there are about 100 archaeological sites. Within these, most of the archaeological sites, about 45 of them, are of a particular uh, grave culture, which we call it uh, initially as the Gandhara grave culture. Uh, but later on, through my study, um, and uh, there were uh, references, some, some of the people have worked on it. So we now call it the proto-historic burial tradition. So there, there is a proto-historic burial tradition sites, uh, which primarily consist of cemeteries, are within uh, this area. So there are, there are a large number of it. Uh, we have proto-historic cemeteries within the Swat area, we have within the upper Deer area, we do have within Gilgit Baltistan, and similar um, burial tradition, although they may be earlier uh, in date, uh, are also found within the Central Asian region and the Chinese uh, Xinjiang region. Uh, we also have the Bactria Marjana uh, grave culture um, in this part of the Afghanistan. Uh, so. The, this, the archaeology of Chatral, if we want to understand the archaeology of Chatral, uh, the understanding of the, the burial tradition or the grave culture is very important. Now, this, the information that we tried, uh, that we had through the village to village survey, uh, with the super, uh, with my supervisor, Dr. Yu Tiang, and uh, my colleagues from the Department of Archaeology and Museum Government of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, and my colleagues from and students from Hazara University, um, through the support of the British Council Pakistan, we conducted uh, a systematic archaeological site in a very small area. So you can see this is the you know uh, and this is uh, a complete the um, Chatral uh, region. And we did a very small survey within this. Within uh, when we conducted this systematic archaeological survey, where we we uh, use professional knowledge uh, and we intensively surveyed the regions, we discovered about 105 sites within this very small area, and. And this al almost doubled the information on the archaeological sites within the Chatral region. So uh, if we conduct similar kind of uh, research within the Chatral region, the number of the archaeological sites would increase many fold. Now, this allows us to document or to map archaeological sites, especially the, the proto-historic burial uh, sites within the Chatral region through the use of the GIS. And you can see that uh, the, the larger number of the proto-historic burial tradition are in a very small area of the Chatral. And, and this number is uh, not just representative uh, of, the, uh, of the extent of this culture, but it, it also shows that we use intensive archaeological surveys. And the knowledge of this region is manifold, many, many fold, many fold as compared to the, the knowledge within the upper um, regions of this, uh, the Chatral area. Uh, so we conducted um, here systematic landscape surveys, which resulted in the finding of many uh, archaeological sites within a, uh, a small area. And we conducted systematic transit survey. So if we apply this archaeological survey within the larger region of the Chatral, the number of the archaeological site would uh, manifold increase. Now, how are the archaeological sites or what sites are we finding within the Chatral? So 
primarily we are finding settlement sites. So this is a very large settlement site within the Chatral region. It's called the um, Parvat Lasht area. So so we have a very large settlement and there were graves somewhere over here. Then we are finding these megalithic circles. You know, this photograph is, is very early in date. So we took this photograph in 2003. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so these are megalithic structures on top of the mountains. Then there are pottery scatters. We are finding pottery scatters everywhere. Uh, and then there are buried um, graves. So these are uh, large chamber uh, burials which has uh, possibly multiple burials within them. Uh, we have not yet excavated this type of uh, graves, but there, there, there are quite a few uh, of these in the Chatral region. However, as I uh, explained in earlier in the, in the map, most of the archaeological sites or the archaeology is, in, is understood in terms of the burials or the graves. So wherever people are cutting their lands for uh, making their houses, um, plowing, plowing their fields, uh, constructing of the roads, they find these graves. So the graves are, the, uh, in this case, the uh, cyst burials. And they are everywhere, almost everywhere you go, you, know, you find graves uh, in Chitra. Uh, and especially uh, our thinking has now um, suggests that most of the settlements um, within Chitral are, are probably, the new settlements are probably constructed or the old uh, settlements, they, they probably existed within this region and these people might have lived in the nearby settlements. But because they are covered by the new settlements, we cannot excavate it. So no settlement archaeology uh, is known for Chitral. The archaeology of this region is known through the archaeology of the graves. So when we go to the field people come up with uh, antiquities from primarily from the graves so there are two or three types of material culture that people like to collect so complete pots they will collect complete pots then they would also uh, ex exotic or exquisite uh, pots so this is um, a, a grave where uh, we know it from northern northwestern pakistan uh, we find it within the, the so-called Gandhara grave, graves from the region, from Swat area. And, and then these are particular, uh, are peculiar uh, terracotta figurines. Uh, uh, we are finding these uh, from, from Chitral. We are also, we have uh, some evidence of them coming from Gilgit area. And a similar kind of figurines have been found in Central Asia as well. And then these are iron implements coming up. So people are keeping this and they are sharing it with us when we go to the field. The archaeological explorations um, within Chatral, as um, Dr. Asta explained, started. Um, I, I think the first uh, proper archaeologist uh, was probably the Victorian uh, archaeologist, historian, uh, Linguist probably Sir Aurat Stein. He went through uh, Chitral and he collected some information on the archaeology of Chitral. Then uh, in the 1940s, or, or in fact in the 1920s, um, uh, yeah, in the 1920s he he, he was uh, there and he visited and he mentioned a few sites in the area. Uh, but then until 1970s, uh, 1960s, there was a lull in the archaeological uh, exploration of this area. Nobody knew anything about the archaeology of this region. 1960s, um, the first uh, few years of the 1960s led to the discovery of protohistoric uh, graves within this region. Uh, and then a proper archaeological survey uh, of, uh, of this region was conducted in 1999. So the first proper archaeological survey within, a, uh, of course, within a very small area was conducted uh, in 1999 by the, the, the British and Pakistani archaeologists from the Bradford University and the University of Peshawar and they documented about 15 of these uh, proto-historic graves. Uh, then from 2003 onward, um, my professor, Professor Esan Ali, myself, uh, and other colleagues, um, Dr. Ruth Yang, um, Dr. Heather Miller, um, and then uh, we had Professor Brian Hamphill, um, 
proper archaeological exploration started. Uh, these were, of course, again uh, limited to small areas. From 19, uh, 2003 onward, we excavated uh, about five archaeological sites uh, within uh, this region. So the sites of Parwak, the sites of uh, Shamirande, uh, Gankurini Teg, Chakasht, and there were two earlier uh, excavated sites um, by the Italian archaeologist Professor Giorgio Stokol uh, within the Chitral area. So the archaeology uh, uh, I'm repeating this again and again that the archaeology of this region is known only and it is um, coming up. We do not know really most of the uh, excavations uh, due to a variety of reasons are still um, in the process of uh, publications or have not been published. So what are these protohistoric burials? Protohistoric burials within the Chatrayal areas, they are, they are, there is a huge variety of burials as well as graves, as well as um, the construction or the material culture within the Chatrayal region. So say, for example, they, these are proper uh, cyst burials, and then this this human being was buried without any uh, the provision of any structure to it so we later on uh, dated it so it it was a later insertion uh, into the um, the graves these may or may not have been part of the uh, of the grave culture uh, but these kind of uh, sites that we excavated th there was so much variety so for example th they would construct a grave and then there would be nothing in it it would be empty so so these were either intended uh, graves you know people uh, constructed them or intended them to contain uh, the body of some someone uh, of, of their beloved um, but you know it it can it did not it eventually was left empty. We do not know the meaning or why people have left uh, uh, graves uh, empty. There, there is no material culture, there is no human body, there are no animal remains within them. Then we have burials, but we have very few bones within them. And some of the bones are from animals. So again, uh, this type so we do not know if they have removed the body from here or these were the only uh, available bones for burial. We, we do not know. Then we have fractional burials or part burials or uns. So, 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 so for example, this un which we were we excavated at the site of Gankurini Take, it had it has been properly sealed by by a part on the top. And, uh, you know, they, they, this contained the remains. We thought that initially that this was cremation, but then it turned out that it also have some of the bones that were not cremated. So disarticulated human bones were also within this spot. So similarly, this spot also had uh, disarticulated human remains. Uh, and, and this spot was buried uh, upside down. So they constructed a grave they, they put the, the, the pots within that grave, uh, but they uh, buried the, the actual un upside down. Then some of the burials um, were in pot. So the pot were in itself uh, a grave. Uh, so if you think this, uh, if you look at this grave, uh, this is an infant burial and there, are, there is no grave good with this. So uh, this young um, child was buried within this pot, and this pot was uh, buried within the cemetery uh, as a grave in itself. And, and this was not in one of one of uh, situation. There were many burials like it, so that we excavated within. So so this. Um, particular uh, young man when uh, we excavated we found uh, beads with it, uh, with him you know with him or her we do not know the the the, the gender of the, the buried individual so so his mouth or her mouth was filled with uh, beads uh, i'll be showing you um, pictures later on 
similarly we also have uh, anbarians uh, um, that they were probably they were wearing a kind of uh, beaded ornament and then some this is a very interesting burial so a pot containing the remains of a, a small person infant and then the head of the the skull of the infant was put within a pot so uh, so the skull was placed within a pot first then the pot was placed within the urn and then the urn was buried uh, as a grave in itself so as i was telling you so so the mouth of this uh, young individual was filled with these beads so there were there were many uh, paste beads and metal beads within the the mouth uh, the jaw bones of this infant now the most important burial tradition within northern and northwestern frontier uh, or the northwestern south asia uh, is the uh, flexed burial this kind of syntax the burial syntax is exist within um, central asia as well as uh, afghanistan we also have similar kind of burials um, from Xinjiang region we possibly have some from kashmir as well and then uh, we we have similar kind of burial practices or burial positions from Mehrgarh, similar to these, largely similar to these burial practices. So this was this flex burial was one of the main tradition of burial uh, within northwestern Pakistan, and it was specially associated with the Gandhara or the so-called Gandhara or proto-historic burials. So. You can see that the, a special cyst was prepared, and then they prepared the um, the floor for the graves as well. So the floor of um, of this grave consisted of uh, one large slab, and then there are smaller slabs, and then the human body was placed uh, within it. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, this did not uh, have any uh, uh, grave goods with it. Then these these are flex burials, um, partly preserved, uh, and uh, they they have uh, pottery or grave goods assemblage as well. This flex burial was not just limited to the adult population of this. So they, they would bury uh, small uh, small persons within this cyst burial. So um, as well. Sometimes the, the smaller persons or the child or infants, they, they were buried uh, in flex position and they, they, they would also um, have this um, grave goods with it. Uh, from here, we also found these beads. These are very uh, unique beads from, from this region. These are called tusk beads. Probably they originated from from marine um, animal uh, i forgot the name of the i i did know uh, now the the name of that but i just forgot so so we have these marine shells they might have come from a very far off region from say from uh, from arabian sea or uh, even as far as sri lanka or they might have uh, found uh, these tusk beads um, through trade from from central asia we don't know the exact location of them then we have double burials with pots and and sometimes the these are facing each other so they are almost hugging one another so sometimes they 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 face the opposite so they, they are not facing the same they are within the same grave they, they their bodies are mingled but they are not facing the same way um, and sometimes they, they are placed opposite to each other so so one individual is placed uh, at the feet of the other individual and their bones are mingled and, and the grave construction differs widely uh, perhaps due to certain traditions, the change over traditions, or the availability of the local materials for constructing the graves, uh, such as the, the slabs for the cyst burials, they come from uh, a nearby mountain, which may have not been accessible at the time. Then we have triple burials. So um, one, the, this, this, this flex burial, 
look to be the the later uh, addition to the grave so the earlier uh, buried individual they have been um, swept to one side and then a new individual is buried and this grave is um, and is five sided it's it's not just a square um cyst it's five sided so they they were following not uh, or there was no particular shape of the graves within this region we, we are not finding um, uh, consistent uh, representation of one type of um, grave within this area then we have multiple uh, grave multiple graves uh, burials within a single grave so there are at least five individuals within this grave so this person seems to be the later addition to this grave and all the other have been swept aside whether this represent a family whether this represent a tradition of reusing the graves or whether uh, as dani some professor ahmed hasan dani has some how put it that it was difficult to 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 bury uh, or to dig graves so um, whether this represent a particular uh, situation um, uh, in fact it is very difficult to dig in this area in the winters uh, and it becomes uh, sub freezing in sub freezing temperatures the the soil becomes very hard and it's very difficult so um, although it's um, it's not the only interpretation but you know this could have been uh, one of the uh, the reason for this um, family lineage family continuity uh, relationship with the elders the ancestors um, you know the continuity of um, using the same place within a community um, or within a family uh, might also have contributed to this type of burials then within these burials we also have animals buried within the uh, graves so uh, we don't know whether they were sacrificial uh, animals whether they were gifted uh, we don't know the reasons for uh, these animals in these graves but we do have um, these burial now most of these burials they come with grave goods so the grave goods are coming from almost uh, whether they are uh, used as a decoration whether they are used as an objects whether they are uh, representative of their um, so status or profession uh, or, or their position within the society we do not know but most of the uh, the burials within the graves that we have excavated uh, were uh, provided with some kind of burials in, in this grave for example uh, i'll be showing a picture later on but there are hundreds of carnelian beads there is no um, nearby source of the carnelian uh, in this region and they might have come uh, from uh, the gujarat region the indian gujarat region uh, um, there is also some evidence uh, as professor Mark and I has uh, put it to me that some of the, the beads might have uh, come from Iran as well and some of them might have been reused from earlier um, ex uh, earlier uh, societies you know, so, so they might be much earlier although they are in a later uh, context now Mm, there is a difference there is a uh, uh, difference within the number of the uh, or the provision of the grave goods within these uh, cemeteries or graves uh, so sometimes a single individual is provided with hundreds of uh, grave goods sometimes a single object uh, is provided to an individual uh, and sometimes these objects are placed uh, within the graves uh, but most of the time we are finding the objects on the body uh, and uh, within say for example the the anklets and the bracelets are found in situ so they were wearing and they were embellished um, at the time of the death so so they, there is a tradition of uh, decorating the dead within this area within the indigenous uh, community such as kalasha so they they are they decorate their dead when they they leave it in the open so that they they 
they wear them they make them wear you know their uh, brightest clothes and their jewelry and their own personal object as well as the community gifts them objects or the objects that were used within the uh, say for example within the ceremonies of the death uh, for example the bed that is being used by the kalasha community is also left in the graveyard so they to don't take it back um, so so these could be the different interpretation of the grave now one of the most uh, iconic objects that we found is the terracotta figurine from this grave so when we removed a body from one of the grave at um, shamirande in chatral uh, we found a terracotta figurine lying underneath so so what does it mean whether this was kind of a ritual this was uh, part of the protection ritual uh, part of the religion uh, or it was a totem we, we don't know we don't know the the meanings um, of this we can access the the styles the the construction techniques and what it looks like what it probably meant but we we really do not know what was happening within this culture these are again uh, different uh, from the female figurine that we are encountering within the the larger South Asian archaeological context, so we do not find similar kind of um, uh, female figurines, say for example, from Harappan civilizations or from uh, Gangetic um, area. We we do not have these kind of. We we have uh, a little uh, similar but much earlier figurines of the same type from Balochistan area, but not within the immediate uh, historical or geographical context of this area. Now, these carnelian beads came, as I showed you earlier, they come from a single individual. And, uh, and these could have been very valuable to the people, monetary-wise, as well as uh, for, uh, for their own religious or cultural or social status-wise. So, um, and these are quite a feature, quite a regular feature of the, uh, the burials that we are finding. And for this, finding these carnelian and paste, uh, carnelian beads from the grave, most of the graves are being excavated by illegal antiquity hunters because they can sell these uh, in the market and they are finding. But we are also finding paste beads from this area. Now, the important thing is that we are on the edge of the Badakhshan province. Badakhshan uh, of Afghanistan is uh, the known source of the, the, the most well-known source of lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli that made its way to the the pharaohs in Egypt, you know, the, and it was quite uh, a luxurious item to have within the Egyptian uh, context. Uh, it originated from 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 the very near uh, area of the, the 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 sites that we are excavating, but we, we do not find um, these beads, lapis lazuli beads from Chatral region. So why we are not finding it, we do not know whether these were inaccessible to the people, whether there was a political reason to it, or uh, there were different people, uh, different religious uh, religion existed there. We do not know. We have paste beads that have been colored as um, blue colored paste beads to imitate the, the color of the lapis lazuli, but not lapis lazuli in itself. Uh, it is a very strange thing. Then we have agate and glass beads. We have a variety of glass beads coming from um, this region, from Chitra. Uh, there, is a, there is a large number of beads. The test beads that I talked about, so we are finding these beads from the graves. Um, these are very unique to the Chitra graves. We have not found a similar type of beads, say, for example, the earlier archaeologist, uh, Professor Ahmad Hasandani, in the nearby region of the Deer and Swat area, we have not encountered similar kind of tusk beads. No, Chatral is, is secluded in a way, and it might have remained secluded in the past, but uh, trade route passed through it. And as I told you, is the most uh, 
uh, accessible route to Central Asia passes through um, one of the most accessible route passes through Chitral, the Barohan Pass. Uh, it is the most flattest uh, pass that you can encounter within the Hindu Kush and the northern Himala Karakurams um, in that area. So we do not know the source of this. They might have come from, um, you know, the Aral Sea, or they might have come from the Arabian Sea, or they might have, you know, they 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 could have come from say as far of far off region as Maldives. You know, we do not know. Then these are coveries. We have um, uh, there is a continuity of using the cover within the Muslims and non-Muslim population of this region, Chatral. So the Muslims, uh, say for example, within the valley of Peshawar, they use it for uh, protecting small kids um, from evil eye or something like that. And the Chatral uses, the, the Kalasha people, women especially, they use it as part of the hairdress. We found these uh, within the graves and <laughs> it's, it's one of my upcoming article is about the cowrie's bead within the context of the the graves in the chatral uh, I I do believe that uh, possibly that they were used as a monetary um, they were part of the monetary system and that people were using it and I have uh, clear evidence um, of them being used uh, as a uh, relatively clear evidence of them being probably used as a uh, monetary system as part of the monetary system and that is why they might have become part of the prestige that the Kalasha have inherited from the past and so it, it wearing uh, a beautiful headdress uh, decorated with the Kaurish uh, beads uh, might have been part of the status symbol or the dance of the the status uh, within the Kalash community. Then we have these, what the earlier researchers have called it hairpins. So we have these hairpins. Uh, I think that they were also part of the dress decorations and they might have been used uh, to, to tie parts of the dress, maybe, uh, you know, a long coat, etc. We also found them um, as part of the dress, as part of the hair as well. We do not know the exact purpose of it. One of, um, I postulated some time ago that they might have been part of the spindles um, for weaving uh, the thread um, within this area. We, we know that the area um, to the, to the east uh, and um, yeah, to the east of this area, the Swat and the Deer area, uh, they, they were known for producing fine quality wool in the past and and there was uh, 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 a large um, number of people involved in the trade of this. Uh, so historically speaking, so I think this they could be part of it as well. Then we have copper seals or buttons. We have these copper um, I don't know the exact reason for it, but there might be uh, mirrors as well. So we were, we were finding it in different areas uh, within the burials, uh, and they might have been part of the um, decoration, the dress decoration, but um, it is also possible that these were small mirrors. Um, then copper bronze amulets, uh, bangles, uh, and iron bangles that we found with the, with the, the buried uh, individuals. And, and there is no difference. The the physical anthropology that we have conducted does not show uh, the, the use of bangles limited to the, the female gender, but they were also worn by the males within the society. And I must um, uh, point it out that the uh, the males and females are almost similarly even the children were our infants were treated almost similarly uh, within these burial traditions in in this chatral area so these are the different bronze and iron bangles that we have excavated from from different excavations in fact they are coming from a small site called parvat within the chatral then we have iron bronze earrings there is a huge variety of earrings 
uh, coming from the graves. Uh, these are very special to me because I found them and, and I excavated them right uh, next to the skulls on either side of the skulls of one particular individual um, at, uh, at the site of Dankuri Nitek. And so, so these are very particular. We, we know exactly that they, they, they were used uh, as an earring. Then there are multiple uh, finger rings coming up. Sometimes the, the the deceased are wearing them. So in fact, one of the deceased was wearing five uh, finger rings in one hand. And then these are bronze belts or bronze spacers that we found in combination with the carnelian uh, beads, the hundreds of carnelian beads that come from one grave. So there were these uh, bronze spacers are coming from there as well. This let us believe that uh, these burials uh, or these grave goods were part of a, possibly a girdle uh, or a belt um, of the deceased individual. Then there are bells. Uh, uh, shell objects. Shell is not uh, local to the region and it comes from marine source. Uh, and the nearest marine source is the Arabian Sea. We we do not know uh, the source of these marines. Um, and this is the, the provision of uh, shell amulet or beads um, or as part of the hairdress is quite um, regular or relatively regular within the graves uh, in uh, Chitral region and in the surrounding. The pottery is, um, is limited uh, by the types that uh, we have uh, found within the graves. So most of the pottery that we are found, finding are uh, either large jars that have used as a kind of container for the body and ants, um, as ants for cremation remains. And we are also finding bowls uh, and these long neck bottles that are coming. So when we encountered the bowl, we carefully um, excavated it. Uh, so at least in one or two of the bowls that we excavated in uh, graves from Gankuri Nitek um, and Shamirande, we found uh, animal bones within the bowls. So the bowls at the time of the death probably contained um, food remains. Uh, intended for the disease or it was part of the ritual or part of the uh, the ceremonies um, around the, the burials. Then the ceramic varieties that we are finding are mostly this is redware and mostly they are smaller smaller parts. Most of them as I told you are bowls, um, these jugs and these long neck uh, bottles. Uh, we are also encountered these, uh, I think these are very smaller number of these uh, smaller pots. Uh, this type of um, pots, they, they have been um, excavated from Deer and Swat area within the Gandhara graves. The, uh, however, within the um, Chatral graves, we found possibly the largest number of arrowheads uh, discovered uh, within the graves or the in northern and northwestern South Asia. Uh, this does show that um, these people were very familiar with the iron technology and that uh, there was uh, possibly uh, this area was um, was known to conflict. We do not know what type of conflicts were there, whether there were interpersonal, um, interregional, or whether they were in conflict with the people um, in the plains. From from historical accounts, say from Robertson uh, descriptions of the of the kafirs of uh, of the kafiristans um, in 1880, we know that the the kafirs or the their their uh, remaining uh, community of the Kalasha, they were in conflict with the the people, the Muslim people in, in Kunar area, and they, they would raid them and they, they would kill uh, male, female, whoever they encountered within the plains or be killed by them. And 
and so there was a, a huge um, possibility the, the possibility of a military uh, or a martial uh, kind of culture existing in the region is, is uh, not beyond the realm of um, possibility so we yeah. We also have spearheads, many spearheads coming from excavations. We then have uh, knives, and then this the, these are two of the same, so probably uh, it is um, a sword uh, or a long knife. We don't know. We don't know the reason for the use for it. Then we are on, not only finding ceramics, um, objects for um, personal decorations uh, uh, or uh, material for say warfare but we are also finding uh, material for daily use so these are the iron needles that we are finding so that they were into stitching clothes so they we have found at least from you know, one side we have found a small piece of cloth in the excavation uh, of the grave and uh, in fact we found it in in the context of uh, or nearby uh, bangles so with the uh, small um, few bangles so we think that these bangles were tied in within the um, this cloth uh, at that place in fact uh, when i was excavating with the italian archaeological mission dr luca maria oliviri and professor massimo vedale we found a burial uh, in in one of the gravesite in the swat area which was pro probably kept within a bag so so they they put probably these were disarticulated these were disarticulated remains and they they collected it from somewhere less then they put it in the bag and then the guy was buried uh, with the bones of the individual so so there, there is evidence of uh, cloth making or uh, cloth stitching at least then these are spindle stone soapstone spindle walls um, so so there is uh, some evidence of uh, clothes being manufactured locally or or the thread of it is locally. then there are grinding stone we know that there are lanes for agriculture we do not have the evidence of agriculture implement so the grains this this was probably used for grinding grains um, or maybe for some other reason, but um, I think that this was from Kangstrom. Now, from Chitral area, we have 10 uh, radiocarbon dates. Uh, and these carbon uh, radiocarbon dates, nine of which I have put over here, these are published dates. Uh, they date from about uh, 800, um, from about 800 um, century B, um, BC, uh, 800 BC to about um, 1650 CE so and they are coming from cemeteries uh, they are from directly dated so we have this tradition of burying uh, the dead um, in, uh, in Chitral starting around or the dates that we have from 8th century BC and continue until the 16th century. We do not know the introduction of Islam, but we know that it was very late introduced, very lately introduced in this area. We have some historical references to the introduction of Islam in the neighboring area of Gilgit Baltistan in the 16th or 17th century CE. So before that, these were back. We also have uh, a date for uh, an area that I'll be showing you, which dates to about 1200 BC. So we have evidence of human evidence within uh, Chitral area from 1200 uh, BC to 1650 BC. We also have, um, the French archaeologists have worked in a very small area of Chitral and they have discovered a few, five, I think five or six stone tools from uh, a couple of sites and they think that they are dated uh, from 800 B, 8000 BP to 2000 BP. So it means that people were using, um, were possibly using stone tools in the Chitral area um, 
almost at the beginning, in some part of the Chitrali area, almost at the beginning of the common era. So almost 2000 years ago, they were still using stone tool, but we do not have a lot of evidence of it. Um, this uh, proto-historic burials, they definitely continued from uh, uh, 8th century BC and they, we have a date for 17th century CE as well. Now, our latest excavation is one of the cave from Chitral, the Chilam Dust Cave is very interesting. Within this cave, we excavated a small area. Within this small area, we encountered uh, an iron smelting workshop. So there, there were uh, ovens, there were uh, twires. So you can see the twires. So this was a kiln. And then the residue is there. So we found a lot of these. And from from the bottom of this kiln, we did a, a radiocarbon date, it, and it come to about 1200 BC. This is possibly the earliest evidence of iron in northern and northwestern, the manufacturing of iron in northern and northwestern South Asia. Then we have the Buddhist, the possible Buddhist evidence from Chitral. We do not know the exact context of this uh, uh, figurine. This came to me uh, from a private collection. Uh, they give me access to study it. They, they told me that it comes from Singur area of Chitral. We are not sure, but if it is coming from this area, and I have written an article on it, it is one of the most interesting aspect of it. Now, Within all this archaeological uh, information, none of the evidence is linked to any of the, uh, the major empires, the Kushans, the Indo-Greeks, the Greek, the Alexander the Greek, uh, Great, the uh, Achaemenian, the later, even the Mughals, uh, we do not find any evidence within this area. The only evidence that we have uh, for uh, any uh, archaeological evidence for presence of the empire uh, is the Chinese Tang dynasty burial and material culture coming from one of our excavations. So we found this individual and uh, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of uh, grave goods and these grave goods included um, at least two coins, the Tang dynasty coins that were dated to about 1750 AD. Now this 1750 is very important date because it was the time that the Chinese invaded um, under uh, the Tang dynasty, they invaded this part of the land to, to reclaim this area. And this is the only evidence that is coming from the Chatral region of the presence of the empire or the people that were connected through trade possibly or um, they were under their suzerainty. We, we have historical Chinese reference to the area uh, and in fact uh, these the the um, they were the the Chinese were the overlord for this area for some times and this area was very important for the the initial great game between the Turk, the Turk Muslims, the Tibetans, and the Chinese, uh, and they fought right uh, on the border area of it. So Chinese were very much interested in this area. They wanted these small areas, these small kingdom, to be on their side, and they should resist. In fact, the Chinese fought them in uh, the Tibetan in in the Chitral and Gilgit region, and they stopped their incursions. Um, into Central Asia from the Tibetan incursion into Central Asia are their alliance with the uh, Arab and Turks Muslim in Central Asia in the 8th century CE. So you can see these uh, Chinese uh, coins from our excavation from this intuition. Now this brings me to the last slide and uh, so I have showed you almost um, all the evidence of coming up, almost all the accessible evidence to me coming up from, from Chitral area. And, and they are not connected in any way with either the, the, the religion. So we do not have evidence of Hindu religion. Uh, in fact, we think that 
uh, uh, I postulated somewhere that there was probably uh, a competing uh, the, the existence of competing ideologies within the um, the area of the Piedmont area of the Hindu Kush and Himalayas mountains, which was quite different from the prevalent Hindu. Um, ideologies in the plains of the South Asia that they were quite different. So, for example, one of the major difference was uh, possibly that goat was very important for them as compared to the cow. So, so almost everything uh, if, uh, uh, revolves around the goat, whether it is an ibex, a marhor, um, or a mountain goat. But it, it was very important for them. And then they are not linked so there is no uh, buddhist uh, sculptures um, uh, from this area we only have few um, scribblings or uh, petroglyphs of the stupas there are only three stupa petro petro petrographs and one or two inscriptions from this area that allude to um, the existence or the passing of the buddhist from this area but there is no mainstream evidence of buddhism you may recall that Chatral uh, is located near Swat. Swat was the center of Buddhism uh, within northern and northwestern South Asia, uh, but we do not have over here. And we are similarly now. I'm working in the Yasin Valley uh, of the Gilgit Pakistan, which is just across the mountains um, on the eastern side of the Chatral, eastern and northeastern, possibly um, on uh, side of the Chitra and we are finding similar kind of it so so there might have been competing religious ideologies when the buddhism was at a prime people in these regions were not um, converted or they were not part of the buddhist religion when when the hindu shahiya was ruling um, northern and northwestern uh, pakistan and afghanistan in the 8th 9th and 10th century AD um uh, they 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 have they have left no evidence almost no known evidence of them uh, although as i told you in the beginning that the kalasha traced their origins to the greeks and so they 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 call themselves as the um, the remnants of the alexander the great but uh, we have not found a single evidence of, uh, of the presence of the uh, greeks alexander's army or the Indo Greeks who have ruled most of the northwestern South Asia from within the first and second century BC, uh, but we we do not have their evidence. We uh, this we do not have the Scythians presence over here. We we do not have uh, the Huns presence. We have some historical evidence that they are might have been heptalites within the area, but we do not know archaeologically their presence. The Mughals, uh, uh, I have heard things, I, although I have not seen that, the Mughal used uh, Chitral as a um, prison and they, they, they would uh, send people to Chitral to, to be present to the circumstances, the geographical and geological circumstances, but we do not know that. So we do need to do extensive explorations and excavations in this area. We do know, need to uh, undertake contextualization of the archaeological evidence of this area and compare it with the surrounding area. Uh, we do need to have scientific excavations, explorations, also scientific analyses, say, for example, DNA analyses uh, of the burials. Uh, we do not, uh, need more radiocarbon dates. I suspect that uh, the archaeology within this region, say, for example, um, uh, can can go up to you know so the uh, late later Pleistocene area or the early early Holocene area when glacier uh, glacier receded from this area. So we do we do need to have investigation of this area. I hope this is enough for today and thank you very much. Thank you um, Heritage Society for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so. Thank you. Dr. Muhammad Jahi, sir, for your very insightful discussion on a very interesting theme and uh, one of the archaeological sites from Chitral region. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for setting light on the archaeology of this very important region. Uh, I now invite 
all our audience whoever are connected on our with us on different social media platforms if they have the, any queries questions or feedback you may put it up in your in the comment box and the same will be displayed over the screen in order to connect with our distinguished speaker in our today's session um, we are receiving comments but maybe sir if you allow me uh -huh. uh, i uh, maybe i take it as an opportunity but to put some queries uh, not really queries but just some comments um i was wondering uh, sir if uh, there is any ethnographic study of the reason and if there is any linkage between the festivities of the kalasa people and the the material culture of the or the grave uh, burial culture that has okay. been seen in the archaeology so any linkage between the yeah so the, there are two parts of your question one that uh, that i understood is that is there any ethnographic studies of these uh, people uh, and if these people uh, the kalashas can you know kind of festivities are linked with the proto historic burial so the first yes there are ethnographic studies there are people have studied them you know i have i have met with linguist uh, say at harvard who think that the 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 kalasha language is the which they call it as kalasha uh the language is itself is called as kalasha mm -hmm. while the language of the chatral uh, the chatrali people is known as Kwa, both are um, indo-european but the kalash um, uh, is the kalasha language is one of the oldest uh, possibly one of the oldest languages in south asia and it has um i, I met professor witzel and if i correctly remember him you know so uh, it might have been one of the earliest language in South Asia. So, so this is uh, one thing. People have studied their customs. People have studied um, their festivals, why they do it. Say, for example, they have four important festivals. You know, they are linked with the, the nature. So, so there is a winter, uh, there is a spring, there is the um, summer. Uh, and they are linked with the summer solace and uh, winter, winter solace. Um, people have also studied um, their possible, um, say for example, husbandry practices, animal, uh, animal, um, say for example, animal grazing, animal keeping, animal husbandry, you know, whatever, they, and their agriculture practices. So their women are uh, mostly um, responsible for uh, some of the things, and then everything. Uh, is uh, studied one of the greek um, uh, philanthropists who worked in this area because you know this area the people claim that they are from alexander uh, so it excites greeks research greek um, there are few uh, in the past at least 10 years ago there were some people who were staying in kalasha area and they have built a museum which is called kalasha dur museum and has got extensive collection of their material culture. One of the, the beautiful museum in, in our province is the Kalashatur Museum. It constructed with the Greek money from India. So having said that, uh, there is not much archaeology in that area. Nobody has worked extensively. We have done some dental um, studies, um, you know, the morphology of the um, a dental morphological study of the Kalasha population with Professor Brian Hemphill. Um, so there is a lot of studies have been done, but not linked with archaeology. Now, personally, uh, I, I do not uh, believe in the continuity uh, of the Kalasha uh, festivity and their linkages with the say the proto-historic burials. The dates that we have for proto-historic burials in northern and northwestern uh, so, uh, South Asia, they, they start almost at the beginning of the third, uh, uh, at the end of the third millennium BC, 2200 BC, and they come up to uh, around um, first century BC in Swadindir area. And then uh, in Chatral, they continue up to 16, 10th century uh, AD and 17th century AD. So this is about almost 4,000 years uh, time period so a culture or a society or a festivity 
could not have sustained that much time. You know, it, it might have changed. I, I I do think that there might have been some link, uh, linkages within the uh, some of the uh, tradition that continued in this area, whether they they are of the uh, Kalash origin or they from earlier people or from the people of the graves. We do not know that. So I, I, I'm not sure about that. Thank you, sir. Uh, there are some uh, comments coming from uh, our audience also. Uh, Dr. Sir, Abhimanyu I have Prasad. One question. Yeah. <laughs> sir, kindly explain a little bit of their worship pattern. You told us that uh, they were into Pagan worship. So uh, are they were you know worshippers of elements of nature? Uh, nature? Kindly just you know. Explain yeah. So them. okay. So the Kalasha um, religion. Uh, I suppose that you mean about Kalashas. Uh, the Kalasha um, uh, religion is quite relaxed. Uh, it does not have uh, a written book, so there is no no written book, no text to go to. There are elders who continue with the stories of their elders and their elders. So they have uh, stories of the beginning of the universe. They are coming into this area, you know, why they are here, their existence, everything is there. And their society is divided into almost based on the gender in two parts, the male and the female and their roles are defined and and they are very status conscious so their status you know material culture defines their status so if they have material means more material means the more status they have within the society and this status is usually achieved by males uh, and not females uh, and females are the most uh, liberal uh, female culture that you can find within um, northern and northwestern South Asia uh, is perhaps of the color. The people, are, the the women are uh, are say, for example, free to choose uh, who they want to marry, when they want to marry. They just have to leave their home. That's it. You know, there there is no um, how should I put it? There is no um, you know societal forces that uh, decide where where they are going to marry. Or who are they going to marry? Or how long they are going to be with their uh, husband? If they don't like their husband, they leave it. They leave him. You know, just straight. Uh, so their women uh, have powers, but they have limits as well. Uh, so they, for example, the women are not allowed to go to the sacred places. The Jastakhan or the the temple, their temple is not for uh, women. It's a male only, you know. So most of um, uh, the, there is what I have read about the Vedic religion. You know, there are elements of the Vedicism possibly within there. So there are a lot of animal sacrifices. You cannot achieve a social status if you do not do the animal sacrifices. And the animal sacrifice, especially of the goat, is linked with the death, uh, uh, especially with the death. So so you have to, they are, these are small, three small valleys. There are about 4,000 of them still surviving. So they have to invite everyone. They have to feed them. They have to feed them good. They have to give them wine. They have to have them pure ghee. And also, you know, a lot of the goat meat. Um, and this defines them. The, so there is no structure or religious uh, festival say for example they do not have a structure like uh, as a muslim i have a structured life so i have i'm supposed to pray five times a day so and, uh, but they don't have so neither the uh, men or the women they, they do not pray they only uh, go to the jastakhan in my understanding at the time mostly at the time of the festivals and these festivals are uh, nature driven so yes um, um, maybe you know they are nature worshippers possibly there are um, because of their interaction say for example in my view uh, and there is some literature on it they have developed the idea of the the larger uh, gods you know there are smaller gods there are smaller deities 
there are landscapes say for example Tirishmir is the highest mountain within the Tran. so they think that this is the abode of um, uh, their uh, ancestors and it is the region of the fairies you know so the fairies uh, live in the Tirishmir area uh, and they, they think of a god now maybe this is very recent uh, maybe they, they had from initial time because there is no written script so we do not know uh, and they call it Khudai so Khudai the god the uh, the creator uh, but we do not know you know we do not I at least do not know whether uh, you know in in think that the pagan the Muslim call them pagan their uh, immediate neighbors are Muslims and they have um, a very um, uh, you know there are always politi politics within different communities living so 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 they call them pagans but you know whether they are nature worshippers or they are idol worshippers you know they, they are just the Khans or temples do not have idols I have seen uh, only ram ram heads uh, you know they, they 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 have sculptures of ram heads on on the doorways or on the the interior of them and their 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 religious activities are mostly uh, linked with sacrifices and fire thank you sir uh, there are some mm -hmm. more questions coming up from audience maybe one last question uh, uday mm -hmm. is asking uh, dear mm -hmm. sir what is the dating of chitral Oh, okay, by dating of Chitral, you mean the archaeological cultures, uh, the, the the dating of the or the chronology of the archaeological cultures within Chitral. We have um, limited um, radiocarbon dates, uh, and uh, we have ten radiocarbon dates. My colleague uh, at the department now, uh, and one of my past students, he has now um, submitted about fourteen. Um, samples for radiocarbon date and dna analysis so we would have so in in the next uh, few years maybe we have a, more radiocarbon dates from this area the radiocarbon dates from chitral that we have uh, indicate that the the iron smelting started around 12th century bc yeah, this is the earliest radiocarbon date uh, and this is the earliest ra radiocarbon date for iron smelting in northern and northwestern pakistan to my knowledge maybe um, there are um, possibly there are ancient uh, iron smelting in, in this area but i don't know uh, the and then there are the graves the protohistoric graves they are coming from 8th century bc uh, and they continue um, up to 10th century CE, we have also one burial from 17th century CE as well. So yes, so we have about 4,000 years uh, of uh, history uh, that we have archaeological dates for it. We also have stone tools coming from it from the French archaeologists who worked in this region and they think that you know the, the history uh, or the archaeology of this region goes back to about 6,000 years before Christ or uh, before the common era. So yes, and beyond that we do not have any evidence. One of the, uh, the rock sorry one of the rock carvings that I uh, <laughs> documented probably I think that this is from Bronze Age but you know, or rock carvings are very difficult to take. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's okay. nice to hear more and more from you and even to know more about the Kalasa people and the archaeology of Chitral reason. Uh, but uh, maybe because of limitation of time, may I now request mm -hmm. Dr. Anantastos Dwedi, sir, uh, Honorable Director General of Heritage Society, to kindly present his remarks. Uh, Dr. Dibiri, sir. Okay. Okay, let me thank, thank you. you very thank much. You very much. much. <laughs> uh, good evening to all. Myself, Dr. Nantasatos Dibiri, Director General of Heritage Society India. Feels truly fortunate to chair on this August occasion. First of all, many thanks to our esteemed speaker, Dr. Muhammad Jahirji, Associate Professor, Department of Archaeology. Hajra University, Mansehra, Pakistan. Thanks a lot, Dr. Jahirji, for presenting such an incredible talk this evening. 
on the same on the theme say no to mainstream religions and in past exploring and contextualizing archaeological evidence in chital region first of all i hold at early express my earnest gratitude to you for accepting our kind invitation to deliver this historical talk for all our audience by taking time from your busy schedule sir thank you very much thank for you. this first of all in thank one line i can say that it was a very much informative and inspiring session archaeologically and historically speaking the region chitral is highly important area for the extensive study the antiquarian remains of the region are of immense cultural and historical value with potential to shed light on the important art cultural dynamics of early historic period to later times we are privileged to hear you and take a heritage look of the region through your lenses the pictures of art objects in your presentation have allowed us to pay a virtual tour of the chitral the systematic and intensive archaeological surveys conducted in chitral region by you and your team provides an insight to the historical process of the region the festivities and the rituals attached with the burial practices such as the decoration of grave and burials of goods and daily use items seems to be very interesting archaeologists of india and abroad can execute comparative studies of the development of burials in south asia the variation in grave construction and the inconsistent nature of burial practices with single to multiple burials in one grave may shed more light on the development of burial practices in south asia although uh, the proper archaeological explorations and excavations began very late in the region probably in the 1960s as i remember you talk and it a very small portion of the region has been excavated and much yet to be unearthed at the end i can say that your presentation invites scholars of different countries to study more and more in chitral region congratulations to all members of organizing committee of virasat talk lecture series for this historical session thank you so much thank you thank you, thank you, so. thank you very much yeah. uh, may i now request uh, divya sani ji to present vote of thanks Uh, good evening all on behalf of heritage society i divya seni give a really heartfelt vote of thanks to our distinguished speaker dr mohammad zahi sir who spent his busiest time and shared his priceless knowledge with us a uh, special mention to our director general dr anant ashutosh tivedi sir being the catalyst he always inspire us to do our best and stand as a pillar of strength I would also like to thank our moderator, Mr. Azad Hind Gulshan Nanda ji, both coordinators, Ms. Manalini Bharadwaj ji, Dr. Astha Dibya Pama ji, and all our participants for making this international webinar a success. Thank you all, and wish you all a very happy and prosperous New Year in advance. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dibya ji, and thank you once again to Muhammad Jahi sir. Thank you to all the the panelists uh, there is a feedback link in the description of this uh, video uh, i request participants to fill the feedback link so in order to receive the participation certificate and also i invite suggestions for the improvement of uh, the virasat talk series and our okay, can i make a last thank you can i make a last comment yeah thank you yes, please, 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 yeah yeah please. thank you very much thank you and i'm i'm very privileged to be here on this forum you know it was really interesting and in uh, your interaction with you was very much uh, you know i i enjoyed it you know before the talk and hopefully this will continue in future one of my thing is that when whenever i go wherever i go i i try to inspire people so the the last photograph that i put on my presentation if you can see you know this this young lady and uh, her sister they have become archaeologists so when i went there and excavated uh, she she is an archaeologist now so in Ch from chatral i have my laborers you know i have took my laborers and they have become archaeologists i took one of my colleague from you know i went to kalash valley and i did um, research with one young lady and she become 
you know, very interested in archaeology. And she has become an archaeologist too. And they they all have got good jobs over there from Chitra. So archaeology is uh, also can pay, you know, you can make your butter, <laughs> so bread and butter through it. So um, thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure. It, I, I'm very much privileged. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you.